talking about you. In fact, all week the lectures are going to be about you and the amazing body that you live in with its incredible ability to heal itself. Can it heal itself? We don't doubt that it won't heal itself when you cut yourself. When you cut yourself, those two pieces of skin will join back together, won't they? And I'm sure we've all got somewhere on our body where at some time we were cut. It will heal itself, little tiny two-letter word here, it will heal itself if, yeah, if you give it the right conditions. One of the conditions is keeping those two pieces of skin together and it might be stitched or it might be um, have a bit of tape put on it or an old bush remedy in Australia is um, bull ants. You don't have many nasties like we do, do you? But bull ants are these great big ants with two pinches and what the old bushmen would do is they'd they'd bite or cut the head off the bull ant and put the pinches in into the two pieces of skin, maybe um, four or five heads of bull ants, and it would hold those, and rigor mortis would set in, it would hold those pieces of skin together. But I think if I was in the bush, I'd rather use the pine pitch. Have you heard that? The pitch out of the pine tree or the sap out of the pine tree will also hold it together. As an orthopaedic surgeon said to me when I was sitting on the plane next to him, he said, Bones were healing long before we orthopaedic surgeons came along. You see, what heals? It's not the surgeon or the doctor or the naturopath or the nutrition. It's the human body. And it will heal itself if you give it the right condition. Now, if you cut yourself and keep opening it and get a little bit of dirt and rub it in and for good measure put a bit of manure in, is that going to heal? No, you know what God gave us? He gave us common sense. And you know there's been a death and no one attended the funeral because no one knew he died. It was the death of common sense. Isn't that true? It's just basic common sense that if you get a cut, and it's not rocket science. You know, you got to wash it, you got to clean it because you see this skin is like a suit of armour. And whenever you split it or cut it or blister it, you have to be careful, don't you? Or pathogens from the air or the dirt may get in and then your body will give a response by swelling it and all your dead white blood cells called pus, you've heard of that? They, they do a mighty job in trying to keep that clean to heal that. So if the human body was designed to heal itself, the million dollar question is, over the other side, why? Why aren't we healing? Well, the human body will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. I'd like to suggest that the conditions aren't quite right. Many are sick through ignorance because they are unaware of the basic conditions required for healing. Some are common sense, granted, but you know, it's been made very complicated, hasn't it? And what I want to do in this series is make it very, very simple because I believe we should be our own doctor because only you how you feel, only you know how your body responds or reacts to different things. In fact, if you say to me, Barbara, feel my sore hand, can I feel your sore hand? No, I can't feel your sore hand. I can have a look. But only you can feel that. And part of being your own doctor is listening. Is listening. Here are some simple things. I'm a bit cold, I'll put a coat on. That's listening. I'm a bit hot, I'll take the coat off. That's, that's simple and we, we all know that. In fact, I was even taking my big coat off today in Invercargill. Yeah. Whoa, I didn't think you did that in Invercargill. <laughs> and well, I was in a very sunny lounge room and I not only took my coat off, I put, took my next jacket off. My body is speaking to me. Now they're simple, they're easy. And when I got to my host house today, they said, are you hungry? I said, yes. Can we eat? <laughs> my body was giving me another sign. It is hunger. And a few hours later, my host said, would you like a bit of fruit? I said, oh, well, I'm still full. Can you see? These are very simple. But going a little bit further to some of the more signs and symptoms, sometimes we're not sure. We're not sure, and I love teaching people how to be their own doctors, and this is what this seminar is all about. So what I'd like to begin with is, why are people sick? What is the true cause of disease? And today in medicine there are two theories, I call them the two Gs, the germ theory and the gene theory. 
So I'd like to address those two theories. I'd like to have a look and see if they are the true cause of disease. And in looking at that, I'd like to have a look at their true role in the running of the human body. And we're going to begin with the gene theory. In 1953, it was headlines in the newspaper. Secret of life had been discovered. Watson and Crick's two scientists had been able to unravel the DNA. What's the DNA? It's the genetic code inside every cell. And we have 23 chromosomes from our mother. Now my mother's chromosomes determine that I have brown hair, that I have blue eyes, and 23 chromosomes from our father. And my father's chromosomes determine that I am short. Now nothing I do will change my height. I might wear some big shoes, but pelvis wouldn't like it. I might put some contact lenses on and become brown eyes. I might dye my hair, but guess what? When I was a hairdresser, I learned that half an inch a month, your hair grows, yeah? And if I decide to be blonde in half an inch, what's coming through? Brown. Because nothing I do will change that. It seems like a tiny little step to say, nothing I do will change the fact that my mother had rheumatoid arthritis and diet 51, so so will I. And I'm 63 and you've probably noticed I'm not dead. That's because genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? It's not a death sentence, your genes. So you could... You could say to Angelina Jolin, you don't have to take your breasts off. You don't have to cut your ovaries out. Genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. And you can switch that trigger on or off, depending on the conditions you give the human body. That's why you're the doctor. So let's have a look at how this can be done. Now, our body is made up of 100 trillion cells. In fact, if I look at my skin, I can't see cells. But if I put it under the microscope, I can certainly see lots of little cells. When you think about it, we are just a bunch of cells. We're eye cells, hair cells, brain cells, skin cells, bone cells, um, pancreatic cells, liver cells. And to understand how the body heals, we need to go, we need to know how it works. And to know how it works, we need to go to the CBD. What's the CBD? The central business district of the human body is the inside workings of the cell. And we're going to go there just about every lecture. And we're going to go to different places. Did you know there's a literal city inside the cell of the human body? Let's have a look. Here is the cell. And today we're going right to the nucleus in the center where the DNA is. And what Watson and Crookes had been able to do is pull out the DNA. And you've probably all seen drawings of the DNA. And there's a lot of information in the DNA. It's like a library. And if you were to put all the information that's in the DNA into alphabetical language, it would fill a thousand books with a thousand pages and three thousand letters on each page. I can hardly understand that one. Psalm 139. Verse 14, the Bible says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And that psalmist didn't know about the DNA. And that is all coiled up right in the middle, and it's made up of the food we eat. The outside strands are made up of polysaccharides. And polysaccharides basically means many sugars. And everything we eat is made up of many sugars. That's the outside strands. The inside bands is made up of amino acids. And amino acids is a breakdown from the protein that we eat. So at lunch today, I had chickpeas. In America, they call them gabanzos. Very good source of protein. At breakfast, I had some nuts and some grains. More source of protein. Now, the glue that glues these two together is minerals. And the food that is the highest in minerals is dark green leafy vegetables. We should eat dark green leafy vegetables every day. And if you don't eat dark green leafy vegetables every day, you should have a dose of green barley or spirulina or chlorophyll. Most people would prefer the dark green leafy vegetables. And when I look at some supermarket trolleys, I wonder how their DNA will ever be made. <laughs> Where's the nutrients? Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. 
and 400 BC, he didn't know about the DNA and how its very structure is made up of the food that we eat. We are constantly being remade. You've got new eye cells every one to two days. That's why if you have eye surgery, it's almost day surgery. And if you get something in your eye, you've got to get it out within a day, ideally, because guess what? The cells will grow over it. And I'll tell you what, it's so annoying. It's our body saying, get it out, get it out. Isn't that true? You ever had something in your eye? <laughs> the next quickest of the cells that line our gastrointestinal tract. And on Friday night, I'll be looking at det in detail at our gastrointestinal tract. In fact, on Friday night, and that I think it's at the other venue, on Friday night, we're going to start at the mouth and I'm going to take you on a journey all through the gastrointestinal tract. Fascinating. But it's lined with villi. This is, once you get out of the stomach, it's lined with villi that basically look like that. The new cell is made down here. It travels up and away it goes every three to five days. You've got a new liver every six weeks. You've got new bones every three months and you've got a new skin every month. Where does the old skin go? Isn't that why we wash our clothes and wash our bodies and vacuum our floors and wash our sheets? Because you're constantly letting off the, the dead skin. That's why it's a good idea to exfoliate, you know, rub. I like to have towels that don't have fluffy softness in it. Got a bit hard, rub yourself. <laughs> so every three to five days, new cells that line the gut, every one to two at the eye. Constantly being remade. It is said we've got a new body about every two years. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how the new cell is made. And we're going to look at how a new gastrointestinal tract cell is made. All the information is in the DNA of everything. But we don't want the information on how to make a new brain cell liver cell. So that's all switched off and the information we want is switched on. And a photocopy is made because even though DNA can be pulled out and put back in, it cannot leave the nucleus. So a photocopy is made, RNA, and it travels down to another section in the cell called ribosome. And ribosome is the little factory or basically the workshop where the new cell is made and the new cell starts to be made. Forgive the illustration, but it's, it, it actually helps you to understand how the new cell is made. The first brick goes down and the brick is an amino acid. Maybe it's tyrosine. Then the next brick goes down and the next brick is another amino acid. Maybe it's phenylalanine. And then the next brick goes down according to the formula. And maybe that one is methionine. So brick after brick goes down and every three to five days out pops a new gastrointestinal tract cell. Every three to five days. Okay. Well, how come someone with Crohn's disease, irritable bowel, colitis, how come they don't heal in, let's be generous, two weeks? Is that a reasonable question? I'd like to suggest it's a very reasonable question. So in addressing that, and I'll address it in detail on Friday night, but I'd like to touch on it now and show you how the new irritable bowel syndrome cell is made. So photocopies made called RNA comes down to the little workshop factory ribosome where the new cell is made. The first brick goes down. Maybe the first brick is there, tyrosone. It's time for the next brick to go down and we've got a problem. A piece of information is missing. Body's not quite sure what to put in there because it's not there. Ever tried to make a cake and there's a piece of ingredients missing? Doesn't work. <laughs> there's a rogue cell and this rogue cell is a breakdown from maybe chemicals, genetically modified foods, and it's always looking for somewhere to poke itself. So in it pokes because there's a gap. It's just looking for a gap. Now it's time for Methionine, but oh no, there's no methionine. The person is suffering from a protein deficiency or maybe their gut's not working and they can't break down their protein properly. So we've got another gap and another rogue cell comes along and in it pushes itself. And then maybe phenylalanine comes along and where's phenylalanine gonna fit? Can you see? There's no shape. It's like pieces of a jigsaw. 
It's just incredible, the workings of the human body and how everything has been designed to fit perfectly in. And we've got another problem. The person is short in minerals. Minerals literally glue us together. Dear, we're in a sad state, aren't we? And every three to five days, out pops a new, very sad-looking, irritable bowel syndrome cell. Now, what I did just then was I touched on a, quite a few reasons why people are not healing. But the one I'd like to look at in detail is now, is what is causing the damage to the DNA? And sometimes the damage is over here, especially when you realise that there are enzymes constantly going up and down, healing the glitches. But if the person isn't supplying the nutrients to make the enzymes, can you see not even the enzymes can be made? So let's have a look at what causes the damage in the DNA. Question mark. Well, 92% of DNA damage today, research is showing, is coming from a mineral deficiency. A mineral deficiency? How could people be mineral deficient? I know in Australia, because we're uh, English-Scottish descent, that a lot of people, I know growing up, we only ate a lettuce leaf in the middle of summer. And every night we had chops or sausages, mashed potatoes, frozen peas or beans every night of the week. There's not a lot of minerals in there. Now, we know that people that live on fast food, they're not getting any, but even people who are eating fruits and vegetables aren't having the minerals. One of the reasons is today in agriculture, the soil is used again and again and again. You see, when a crop is in the ground, it uses minerals to grow. And so when that crop is taken out, no, no other crop should be put in until all the minerals are replaced. There's your compost. That's why organically grown fruits and vegetables have a far higher mineral content. Have you ever eaten an apple off a tree? Taste is amazing. Or strawberry off a strawberry plant. You know what you're tasting? Minerals. It's minerals get, that gives food its flavour. I was on the plane one day and I got an apple. Took a bite. Ah! If I'd had um, eye patches on, I wouldn't even know what I was eating. I'm afraid I couldn't eat it. There was no flavour, no flavour, no minerals. So why didn't it have minerals? Maybe it was grown in soil that was treated with superphosphate. Superphosphate produces show ponies of vegetables. Looks good, but there's no flavour in there. And because that plant is so deficient in basic nutrients, all the bugs attack it. And then the farmer comes along and sprays it. And that further reduces it. Then it's picked too early. Then it's stored too long. Can you see all the little bits and pieces that are bit by bit by bit robbing the minerals out of the plants? So this explains why so many are mineral deficient today. 92% of DNA damage, the research is showing, is a mineral deficiency. There's an excellent book that goes into detail in this. It's by a Dr. Robert Thompson. It's called The Calcium Lie. And he has the figures in there that show that you know, our soils are deficient. Our plants are about 50% less minerals today than it was 50 years ago. Scary. But there's more. There are stimulants that people are partaking of that rob the body of the minerals. So one is the food doesn't have enough, and the next is I call it Australia's darling. Don't know if it's New Zealanders darling. Caffeine. Caffeine not only disrupts the, new, the neurotransmitters in the brain, affecting the DNA so that the baby can be born with a tendency to attention deficit syndrome and hyperactivity. So stimulant caffeine not only disrupts the neurotransmitter gene, but it also robs the body of magnesium and calcium. Also, sugar, and I'm referring to the pure crystallised acid that's been extracted from the sugarcane plant. It is said that it leaves our body better dressed than when it went in. What does it leave with? Our minerals. What also, um, so they're two big mineral leeches, but what another stimulant that damages the DNA is alcohol. Children are being born with fetal alcohol syndrome to parents that have two drinks a week. 
Absolutely, it's dangerous for a, a woman to drink alcohol in pregnancy, but I'm talking about before that. I'm talking about the, the DNA, the genes that have been given to that baby because both parents' um, drinking habits before they even conceive. Bruce Lipton in his book, Biology of Belief, he claims that parents are the genetic engineers of their children. Our lifestyle habits affect our genes. Also tobacco, children are being born today with less alveoli in their lungs. Holes, holes in the cunt honeycomb shape that holds the alveoli together. These children can develop emphysema without ever having smoked. A lady said, well, what about my 92-year-old grandfather? He's still smoking a pipe. You heard those stories? <laughs> Not a lot of them, but they're there. My answer to that is, well, his mother must have done everything right and he's been born with strong genes. But he wouldn't have given a strong gene pool to his son. And if his son smokes, he'll barely reach 60. And if his son smokes, that's the 30-year-old man in hospital dying of lung cancer, huh? We're not islands. Everything we do affects. What also causes damage in the DNA is genetically modified foods. Did you know that President Valdemar Putin has passed a law that any Russian who grows genetically modified foods is to be considered a terrorist? Whew. Did you think that would come out of Russia? In fact, you put GMO and Valdemar Putin into the net and you'll get his statement. He says, we look over at the West, at the over-medicated, over-vaccinated, over-fed, you know, large technology exposure, and we see the nations being weakened. And you know, the Russians pride themselves on their strength. He's even giving land away to Russians who will grow food organically, non-GMO. Unfortunately, in America, Australia, and New Zealand, they do not have to say if it's genetically modified. What is genetic modification? Basically, it's the splicing the DNA of an Atlantic salmon and the DNA of a tomato together, hoping to, to produce a tomato that will grow in our winter, but actually it doesn't. And then when the tomato grows, it's got all these strange <laughs> centres. There's this huge grey area with genetically modified foods. And it's so grey that they actually don't know the full effect. So how can you ensure that you're not eating genetically modified food. Well, basically, you have to buy organic. If an organic farmer uses genetically modified seed, he loses his status. And you can still get uh, non-GMO, non-hybridized seeds. And the good thing about those seeds is the next year, you'll get more veggies coming up. In my garden, oh, tomatoes are my weeds. Because <laughs> of my... <laughs> Anyway, I'm afraid I have to pull a lot of them out, especially now, because they're not going to survive the winter. But how nice when your weeds are just vegetables. You can pick and choose what you want then. Also, what causes damage in the DNA? You see, eating genetically modified foods has the ability to damp tamper with your DNA. Chemicals. We've got to get the chemicals out of our homes, out of our toothpaste, out of our shampoo, out of our food, out of our laundry cupboards. What you can clean with, and it's real cheap, vinegar. White vinegar and sodium bicarbonate powder. In Australia, we have a sodium bicarb paste called gumption. I don't know if you have that here. And the other is elbow grease, <laughs> scrubbing it. And also the microfiber cloths. The that's cheap cleaning. You want to become a millionaire, become a green cleaner. I've known a few that have become very wealthy because there's a lot of houses out there that want green cleaners. And there's a lot of families where mum and dad are working and they need, they need a cleaner. Also, the, probably the biggest chemical company in the world is the pharmaceutical company. Drugs never cure disease, they just change the form and location of the disease. This week, I trust by the end of the week, you'll have a lot of alternatives to drugs. I acknowledge that drugs in a crisis can save a life, but you know, drugs are being used when there's no crisis. So that's where I can help, is to come in and show you what you can do. And they have the ability to, to, um, to, to damage the DNA. The thalidomide tragedy is a reminder of, of such a thing. Also, what can damage the DNA is um, 
electromagnetic field excess. Now we are electrical people, how I love my iPad because I'm able to go all over the world and still answer my emails and help especially mothers with sick children. But I try not to have it on my lap. Do you know what the research is showing now? Young girls that have their iPads or their um, computers, their laptops on their lap, those girls, 47% of them are having miscarriages when they have babies because it's on their lap and it's, it's actually interfering with the development of their eggs. Gee, so on the table, <laughs> have it on the table. So I'm referring to the excess. We are electrical people. There's a spark of electricity in every cell in the body. Now we had a guy come and do our program and let me show you what was happening to him. We could not have any Wi-Fi in the room when he was there. We had to take away our hands-free phones and put the plug-in phones. So how come he could not be in and there and yet everyone else could? Let me show you his story. This is his body or uh, illustration. Let me show you the things that happened with this man. He had a root canal filling that went bad and it got infected and it was hurting. And you know, whenever we've got a pain, the body's knocking. What's it saying? Can you please do something? So he came in with the painkillers. What's happening to the knock now? Can't hear it, but can you see it's still knocking? You just can't hear it. And you know what starts? Then the body gets the sledgehammer out, bang! The next tooth got infected and then his whole side of his head um, swelled up. You know, he, he had the sledgehammer. The poisons that were giving off from that root canal filling were poisoning him. And eventually, when it got so bad, he went to the doctor, he went to the dentist and had the root canal out. But also, while in the meantime, he's taking painkillers, which are some more poisons going in. And then at the same time, his car was locked up in the shed for a while with the windows open and there'd been a lot of rain. And he opened the door and it was all mouldy. So he got, okay, here's another poison, the mould. And then he got bleach. Do you know, you put bleach on mould, you create one of the most toxic combinations on the planet. Okay, more poisons. We're almost up to the top. And then they put a smart meter in his house. Okay, right up the top. And now he only has to go in, you know, near Wi-Fi and one more drop of poison in, what's he got? Overload. That's an illustration of ke chemical sensitivity. But can you see all the, all the environmental poisons that built up in him? That's why he had overload. Oh, I didn't put another one in there, let's put it in here. He smoked. <laughs> and it was a lot easier to blame the smart meter than the cigarette in his mouth. Now, neither are good. I said, mate, the best thing you can do is stop smoking and start detoxing the body. And little by little, as he detoxes the body and gets it right, he can bring that level down. Can you see that? So be very careful of your exposure to electromagnetic field. Be very careful of the room you're sleeping in. If possible, charge your phones, your iPads in the next room or even the far corner. Now let's say this is a, um, a hands-free phone there. Now if I've got it on my ear half the day, I'm in trouble. But you know, I only have to go a metre away. Have you heard of speakerphone? <laughs> I'm a bit of a slow learner, I've just discovered it. And you've got about 50% less exposure. You only have to go about three foot away and you've dropped your exposure by about 90%. So that's really good to know that uh, you don't have to go very far away and you greatly reduce your exposure. So just be careful of your exposure, especially of the room that you're sleeping in. Something else that many people don't realise is quite a toxic poison and that is mould. In fact, if you, if you look in the Bible, it talks about mouldy house, destroy the house, mouldy clothes, burn them. <laughs> this is toxic stuff. When I was a little girl and the bread was mouldy, my mother used to say, it's all right, it's just penicillin. It's actually not quite like that, as I will show you. What is mould? Basically, it's a microorganism. And micro means microscopic. Organism means it's a living thing. And microorganisms, and I'm not just referring to mould, I'm referring to the whole range of them, they're everywhere. They're in the air we breathe, they're on our skin, they're in our eyes, nose, ears, mouth. 
In fact, there are 10 times more microorganisms in the human body than cells. And there are 10 times more in the gastrointestinal tract than anywhere else in the body. And these microorganisms play an integral role in the living, running of human body, of life on planet Earth. But whenever cell damage happens, Whenever cell damage happens, these microorganisms have the ability to change role. The most amazing thing I think about the human body is its ability to adapt and adjust. Have you noticed? I'm adapting and adjusting to your cool weather. And, it, and if I go on a holiday in Bali, I adapt and adjust to that. We adapt and adjust. Now this is good news and bad news, but these microorganisms also adapt and adjust to the environment. So whenever there's cell damage, they now have the ability to change roles and they become the cleanup team. One microbiologist that did our program, he said, we, want, we microbiologists call them the garbage collectors. That's their role on planet Earth. And their name is bacteria. That's what it is, that's what it does. Florence Nightingale knew this. The, She's called the, the um, mother of nursing. She was asked to go to Scutari in the mid-1800s because 50% of the young men that went into the hospital in Scutari were dying. So here's Crimea where the British and the French are fighting the Russians. Here's the Black Sea. They were put in boats and sent down to Scutari where there was an ex-army barracks Turkish army barracks made into a hospital. So Florence Nightingale was asked to go there because 50% of the young men that actually got there if they didn't die on the boats died. They had a better chance on the battlefront than in that hospital. When Florence got there she was appalled. It was filthy. She did all she could but she knew a lot of wealthy men because her father was a wealthy man and influential people and she agitated to the point where they <coughs> started the Sanitary Commission. So a group of doctors came over and looked at it and this hospital was basically built down there <laughs> in a swamp. They found a dead horse, they found a dead dog, so it was basically in a terrible environment. So they quickly fixed it all up. Do you know within six months of this Sanitary Commission starting and Florence Nightingale and her nurses scrubbing the inside, the death rate went from 50% to 2%. This is 80 years before antibiotics. That's why we should never forget Florence Nightingale. That's why the pharmaceutical companies don't want you to investigate Florence Nightingale. And when she eventually, 20 months later, went back to England, they hailed her as a heroine. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were there to meet her. When she saw the welcoming party, she changed her name to Mary Smith and went down the back gangplank and went home. They said to her later, why did you do that? She said, I am not a heroine. All I did was increase hygiene, got that? Sanitation and nutrition. She turned the tap off. And if you don't turn the tap off, they're going to still be mopping up. She made it impossible for these guys to live. They had nothing to eat. Can you see that? That's why this ever should be on our lips. And when she read of Louis Pasteur's theory that germs cause disease, she said, this is the theory of a man of a very unstable mind. And anyone who believes it is equally unstable. She said, germs don't cause disease, they're the result. Mm -hmm. They're the result of unhealthful conditions. Let me take you through the carbon cycle. As the environment change, they change. They now become the exterminators. What are the exterminators? Their name is yeast and fungus. That's the next stage. We see it on the rainforest floor. A lot of debris drops on the rainforest floor. What's going to break it down? As the environment changes, so they change. They now become the mould and of course their name is the undertakers. That's what undertakers do. They take away dead things. And it's not long after the mould stage that the matter is now brought back to dust. What does the preacher say at the funeral? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. What's he referring to? He's referring to what's about to happen in that coffin. 
the matter is going to be brought back to dust. A basic law of science states nothing's created and nothing's destroyed. It just changes form. So what I have drawn for you here is the cycle of life, or sometimes called the carbon cycle. And if it wasn't for the carbon cycle, the cycle of life, there would be so much rubbish on the planet we wouldn't be able to walk on the planet. Let me give you another illustration. Mother Hen is sitting on ten eggs. I come along, I pick up an egg and I shake it violently and I put it back under Mother Hen. I come back two weeks later and I hear chirp, 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 little chickens are breaking out of their eggs. Where's the egg that I shook? You know, chooks don't have very big brains. But there was a bad smell coming out of that egg. So Mother Hen, have you seen what they do? They boot it out of the nest. Because that mother knows that those bad fumes could poison her chickens. What did I do when I shook egg? I caused massive cell damage. And the microorganisms that would have been contributing to the building up of little chicken now have to take their suit of clothes off, so to speak, put their rubber gloves and apron on and become the clean-up team. As the environment changes, the exterminators. As the environment changes, the undertakers, until eventually that egg is now dust. These are the performers in the cycle of life. These are the players in the cycle of life. And if they're around, we have to put the detective hat on and find out why are they there. This will make it easy. We'll have a why on each board. Do you know Rudyard Kipling, he knew the, he knew the importance of that and he wrote a whole poem on it. I'll give you the first stanza. I have six trusty serving men. They taught me all I know. Their names are what, why, when, where, how and who. Have you got your six trusty serving men? And Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion states that to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. There is always a reason. And Proverbs 26 verse 2 states that the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, no problem happens without a cause. To blame these guys is actually doesn't work. It makes no sense. They're only doing their job. <laughs> That's why Florence Nightingale said this, this is not true. About a year ago I read an article in a Time magazine and there were some cases of drug resistant TB in an African village. So I read the article and the health worker is going into one of the little villages to meet with one of the men that has drug-resistant TB. So the journalist follows her up the path. Oh, there are goats pulling out rubbish on the path. Note. Gets up closer. Oh, there's a tin, red and black and white shed there. Ah, oh, Coca-Cola in an African village. Selling Coca-Cola and sugar biscuits. Note. She comes up a little bit closer. She's come to the hut. She pulls the dirty rag aside. That's the door. The stench nearly knocks her over. She steps into the hut. On the dirt floor is the man suffering from drug-resistant TB. I thought, does anyone else see this? Huh? What would Florence Nightingale do? <laughs> the health worker just steps over the rubbish, goes past the hut. If the money spent on those drugs was spent on education, mm -hmm. educating, why is it there? That's what we should be investigating. Why is it there? But notice with the gene theory, it's easy to say, it's not me, it's in my genes. And with the germ theory, it's very easy to say, oh, it's not me, it's, a, it's the germ. <laughs> Let me give you an illustration. Two brothers. One's called Healthy Harry, and the other one's called Sick Steve. <laughs> Healthy Harry is a surfer, drinks a lot of water, eats natural food, exercises a lot, is a landscape garden, always outside, and his brother, Sick Steve smokes, drinks, 
works in an office, doesn't exercise. Cousin Colin visits and he's got a bad cough. <coughs> sorry, mate. <laughs> Do you like it when they cough all over you and say sorry? <laughs> Have you ever seen what comes out with a cough? Sputum laden with little microbes who are busy trying to clean this, this chest up. They jump on sick Steve and go, yippee, feast in this body. What do they eat? They eat rubbish. They're garbage collectors. They jump on healthy Harry. Nothing to eat. Have you seen that? Nothing to eat. You know what a, ho a cold is? It's a house clean. In the 1940s in Edinburgh, the Common Cold Research Unit was set up to find the cause and the cure of the common cold. Notice the time, 1940s. After 40 years they closed because of a total failure to find the cause of the common cold. Do you know what a common cold is? It's a house clean. And when you cough up all those strange looking bits and pieces, rejoice! Where were they before you coughed them up? When I was a nurse, if I got bronchitis and I coughed up yellow things, I'd think, I've got an infection. I must go and get an antibiotic. What does antibiotic mean? Anti means against, yeah? Biotic means life. Uh-huh. Anything that has the ability to kill a small organism has the potential to kill a large, and what are we? We're the large. One percent of doctors today are claiming that antibiotics are causing more problems than they ever cured. 1929, Alexander Fleming, he's growing bacteria in flasks in his laboratory. He comes in one morning and it's all dead and he knew Newton's third law of motion. Why did my bacteria die? He investigates. Nothing in the laboratory. He looks out the window and there's a sun ray coming with a lot of dust on it. And he looked up and in the next story, in an open window was a plate of fruit with a mouldy orange on it. Do you remember from school days? The mouldy orange is giving off a dust. In that dust is its spore, but in that dust is a highly toxic gas designed to kill off anything that would compete with the mould's food source. It's almost as if the orange says, this is, I mean the mould says, this is my orange, no one else is going to get it. And that toxic gas that it gives off settles on other bacteria, yeast and fungus and kills it. Alexander Fleming called the mould penicillium. And he called the mould waste penicillic acid. Now that penicillic acid is the penicillin that we know today. And penicillin has saved the lives of millions, granted. But we've got a problem today. And there's a big thrust to get doctors to stop prescribing so many antibiotics. Have you noticed? Because when someone has a sore finger, antibiotic. <coughs> a bit of antibiotic. My son went with a sore elbow, <coughs> antibiotic. James was 35 at the time. He stood up, he looked at the doctor and said, I've never taken an antibiotic in my life and I'm not about to start. And he walked out. Do you think that doctor's ever heard that? Mm-hmm. And then he rang up mum. <laughs> I'm not against antibiotics. They will continue to save lives. But the problem today is people are so immune to it that when they get a serious problem and the antibiotic may save their life, it actually is not working. And especially in my uh, natural remedies seminars in the day, and I think they'll be filmed, so if you're unable to come, or some of you may have to work, you will be able to access that. But uh, you can also go to YouTube and look at some of my poultice things there, which show, will show you alternatives. So I raised children that got cold. Some of them got bronchitis. I had one child that used to get asthma, and I was able to manage it without antibiotics. To date, they have, they have uh, tested <coughs> 1.5 million different moles, yeasts, and funguses. A thousand of those are known to cause disease in mankind. 
That's why this stuff is toxic. And it's in your house, you've got to keep away from it. It's not what my mother said. Moldy bread is not. <laughs> it is not an antibiotic. Remember what it means? Against life. They were so excited with the discovery, they tested hundreds of different mould wastes and 80% of them killed the rats they were tested on. That's a bit scary, isn't it? <coughs> the human body is designed to heal itself. And in a crisis, drugs may save lives. But you know what? Most people should go through their whole life never even having a crisis. And especially if it's nipped in the bud and especially if the body's given the right conditions. There was a contemporary at the time of Pasteur called Antoine Bouchon. And Antoine Bouchon, six times professor this guy, but most people have never heard of him because his theory was not popular. He said germs don't cause disease, they're the result of unhealthful conditions. Well, no one wanted to know about that. He also said disease is born in us and of us. He got a dead cat one day wrapped it in an airtight container, came back four months later, opened the container, what did he find? One lady sent a dead cat. <laughs> dust, maybe a few bones. What brought cat back to dust? No blowfly and maggots, no dingo had a nibble, no crow had a nibble, no worms came up and helped, no dung beetles helped. Airtight container. The microorganisms who are an integral part of living, running cat had to take their suit of clothes off, so to speak, put their rubber gloves and apron on because of the cell damage and became the clean-up team, then the exterminators, then the undertakers, till eventually they'd brought back cat back to dust. With great excitement, Antoine Bouchon put this dust under the microscope. It was alive with microorganisms. A basic law of science states nothing's created and nothing's destroyed. It just changes form. Isn't that why we have compost bins? Isn't that why we dig our compost into the ground? Because what we're putting into the ground is microorganisms. <clears throat> now they play another role. Here's my plant in the garden. Here's the ground, here are the roots underneath. I put compost into the ground and I'm putting microorganisms that were the carrot that died, that were the weeds that I pulled out and died. Now they play another role. They are responsible for the final breakdown of the minerals, heavy metals, no, not breakfast, breakdown, heavy metals and minerals in the soil. Those microorganisms are responsible for the absorption of those minerals into the plant. Those microorganisms are responsible for protecting the plant against harmful pathogens. Those microorganisms are responsible for nourishing the plant. Now the plant knows that it needs these microbes. So 50% of the fuel that it makes from photosynthesis, it sends back down to the roots to feed the plants. <laughs> Beautiful illustration of taking only to give. Do you know the law of life is taking only to give again? And the law of service is written on every plant in nature. The plant lives to give. We could learn from that. That's why organically grown fruits and vegetables have a far higher mineral content because of the microbes in the soil. I'm going to give you a break in a few minutes, but I'm going to take you somewhere now. I'm going to take these microbes somewhere where you may never have realised it. I'm going to go inside the gastrointestinal tract. Did you know that when we were in our mother's utero, our gut was sterile? No microbes? Last year on Catalyst, a documentary in Australia, they did a, a show called The Gut Reaction. And there was an obstetrician talking on it. And he said, I always thought God made a mistake putting the birth canal and the anus so close. And we know they thought God made a mistake because 40 years ago, if a woman had a baby, she had to have an enema before she had her baby to try and clean out there. Because when the birth canal stretches open, guess what else stretches open? The birth canal. 
Notice what the obstetrician said. I always thought God made a mistake. He said, now we know it's a perfect design. Because when that birth canal opens and the other canal opens a little and the air's coming out of there and the baby's born, the air touches the baby's skin and the baby goes, <gasps> and what's the first breath laden with? <laughs> Microorganisms. And those microorganisms come in and they line the gastrointestinal tract with a thick turf wall. And that thick turf wall is made up of Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium. They're the two permanent that all the others come from. That turf wall plays the same role as it does in the soil. That thick turf wall made of microbes is responsible for the final breakdown of our food. It's responsible for the absorption of our food out of the gut and into the blood. Those microorganisms play a vital role in protecting our blood against harmful pathogens that may be in our gut. And those microbes are responsible for nourishing these little cells that line our gastrointestinal tract. Wow. Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the guts. What might break down that wall? <clears throat> Antibiotics. In fact, one professor of nutrition on this show, he said, taking an antibiotic is like dropping an atomic bomb in the gut. What did the atomic bomb kill? Good and bad alike. And that's what antibiotics doing. It just says, it's just kill. So it can kill off the good guys. What also kills them off? All your statin drugs. As you'll see when we look at heart health, there is not one dot of evidence that saturated fats and cholesterol cause heart disease. Have you heard? I'll be quoting about five different books and five different doctors that show that. Statin drugs. And when a person goes on statin drugs, how long are they told they're on it for? Life. They break down the gut wall. Cortisone breaks down the gut wall. Contraceptive pill breaks down the gut wall. Long-term use of pain-killing drugs. Now, when that gut wall's broken down, what have we got a compromise of? We've got a compromise of the breakdown of the food, the final. We've got a compromise of the absorption of our nutrients into the blood. We've lost our border protection. The cells have lost their nourishment. Wow. Now in the last five years, there's a lot of awareness coming, isn't it, about the role of probiotics. So before the break, I'm going to give you a little quick snippet of what we're going to look at on Friday night. How can we fix that? Number one, probiotics. Probiotics means for life. Probiotics is a little powder made up of Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium. One lady said, oh, I've got probiotic powder and it's got many more than that. Do you know they're the two permanent and all of them are made from that. Number two, you've got to turn the tap off. There are three foods that are like kerosene to the fire on this gut. One is the hybridized wheat and I'll be talking about that later in the week. It was hybridized in the 50s. It created a structure that's very difficult for the body to break down. It's not the wheat that God made. Dairy, Cow's milk is excellent milk for baby calves. <coughs> Got that? And if you give a baby newborn calf the milk in the supermarket, do you know that calf will die? And refined sugar. These three things are like kerosene to a fire on a compromised gut. Number three, Psalm 104 verse 14, the Bible says, God gave herbs for the service of man. I love it. There is a herb that coats, soothes and heals that. And we know it's a bit slimy, isn't it? Aloe vera. The lining of your gut is like the inside of your lip, a bit slimy. So any food that's a bit slimy, the, the, the gut loves. Also, aloe vera contains a growth stimulant. So it stimulates rapid healing in the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. And there is another herb that has 
a similar effect and it's called slippery elm. And when you put water with it, it goes a bit slippery. I've seen many here. Is that it? Aren't you glad it's simple? And when we look at the gut Friday night, I'll explore it a little bit more, but if someone needs help right now, we couldn't wait till Friday night, I had to tell you now, yeah? So simple. In fact, in four or five days, I've had people say, bleeding from the bowel stopped, the cramping stopped. I'm not going 10 times a day, I'm going four times a day. That's in a matter of days. That's exciting, isn't it? It's very exciting. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, they're not the enemy. Mind you, if they're in that in your house, you've got to get them out, but first of all, you've got to find out how come they're there. <laughs> they play an important role. And the fumes they give off, they can kill you. Antibiotics can save your life, but hey, most of us go through, should go through life never even having them. And the DNA, remember, genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. And as we go through these lectures this week, I'll show you the conditions that the body requires for healing. We're going to have a break now. And when we come back at 7.30, I'm going to go one step further and show you the role the microbes play in cancer. And I'm going to touch on some of the conditions for bringing about healing with cancer. I'm going to endeavour to finish off by quarter past eight and in that last 15 minutes um, we'll have time to answer questions. We didn't have time to give you paper for questions so tonight we'll have a time where we can answer questions.